All right. Well, this morning, um, I thought we would now move to from the sort of uh, another various forms of abstraction and also things that are general to people and to get specific to uh, how this business uh, of non-local mind and the implications that it holds has played out in someone's life, a scientist who uh, began as a physicist and, and um, Peter Russell and I met at a conference about 10 years ago and I was very impressed with what he had to say and if you go to these conferences all the time you sort of hear everybody over time and, and you develop a, a certain ear for people who really know what they're talking about as opposed to people who are just talking and, um, and Peter struck me as somebody who knew what he was talking about and I remembered it and, and I liked him. I thought he was just a really interesting man who had done some very interesting stuff. And, and so when I was putting this conference together uh, and thinking about the people that I might include for the weekend, he was one of the first names that came to my mind. And so it is my pleasure this morning to begin this day introducing you to Peter Russell. Thank you, Stephen. God. Makes me feel honored. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do today is something rather different for me. Well, it will start off similar, but I want to really explore some ideas that I've been playing around with the last six months or so, which are really exciting for me which I've never really talked about in public before. So this is the first time, I'm put, maybe the last time too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really an extension of the ideas in my book From Science to God, which is subtitled The Mystery of Consciousness, which is also the title of this talk. And where I'm going is something which maybe a lot of you are already there in terms of intuitive knowing about the fundamental nature of consciousness and that as someone was saying yesterday everything is mind it's something we often talk about some of us know about it intuitively or we just give lip service to it very often but what I've been working on is how that actually begins to fall out from modern physics and from also philosophy and other ideas but to actually see that we can actually make an argument for that in a, in a very much in a western sense we don't have to rely upon our intuitions or whatever to convince people we can actually produce an argument that shows that the fundamental nature of reality is actually consciousness and that's what I want to look at today so it's not so much the conclusions that we arrive at that are important so much for me but the way we arrive at them the argument that gets there so that's what I'm going to be looking at is really the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness. So if we can take the lights down a bit because I shall be using images quite a bit. So let's start thinking about consciousness a bit, what we mean by consciousness. Consciousness, and it's the one thing we cannot deny is the fact that we are conscious. It's probably the only absolute certainty we have is that we are experiencing beings. I mean, right now, for example, we could all be plugged into the matrix <coughs> and just be having this wonderful simulated experience of sitting here in this room. So we could actually doubt whether this is real. But we couldn't doubt that we were still experiencing it. It may be an illusion, but we're still experiencing. In fact, that's what Descartes saw with his famous cogito ergo sum. He was looking for the absolute truth. And he found he could doubt everything, any idea, any philosophy. He even doubted he had a body. He doubted his experience. And this is 350 years before virtual reality. And then he realized the one thing he couldn't doubt was that he was experiencing. And yet this is something which science has consistently ignored for various reasons. I mean, one is Descartes himself. Descartes said... He didn't want to get himself burnt at the stake like Bruno got when Bruno supported Copernicus. So he said, 
let us natural philosophers, they didn't call themselves scientists, they called themselves natural philosophers, we will study the world of things, the world of things in space. The world of the mind will leave to the church. We don't want to tread on their toes. So it was like a sort of safety net to stop himself getting burnt. He said, we'll leave the mind to the church. So that began the split. But also, of course, there's no way to measure consciousness. You can't weigh it. You can't use normal scientific ways of looking at things to measure consciousness, which actually leads to the interesting corollary, the fact that there is no scientific evidence whatsoever for consciousness because there's no way of measuring it. There's no actual experiment we can do to prove that somebody is conscious. We believe they are. We may all be, other people may all be what's called zombies in philosophical language. Zombie is actually a technical philosophical term. You probably don't realize that. A zombie is someone who looks like a human being, acts like a human being in all ways, and even says, I'm a conscious human being, but actually has no consciousness inside. That's the philosophical definition of a zombie. And there is no scientific experiment you can do to determine whether somebody is a zombie or a real conscious entity. There is no scientific evidence for consciousness. And yet we know it. And also science is interested in the objective, the real world, and consciousness is subjective. Science is looking for the truths which are common to all observers, to that everybody can agree upon is actually independent of the observer. And consciousness is clearly very variable according to the observers. That's another reason science doesn't want to touch consciousness. And the third is, well, the fourth, is that the universe, the universe works perfectly well without any understanding of consciousness. We don't need consciousness to explain the universe. And in fact, you get this sort of rather interesting paradox here that science would be much happier if there weren't such a thing as consciousness. <laughs> And yet, without consciousness, there wouldn't be any science. So there's this strange paradox. So things are beginning to change a bit these days, though. Partly, as we've touched upon already, quantum physics. Various things in quantum physics implicate consciousness, the observer in some way. All the work that's been going on in the recent decades to do with the brain, neurophysiology, neuropsychology are all beginning to bring up this question of what is consciousness. We can't deny or can't ignore the fact we're conscious any longer. And of course, in the current times, there's this whole interest in society, in the mind, in personal development, in spiritual growth, which again is all around <laughs> consciousness, the nature of consciousness. So what I want to start off by doing is actually looking, what do we actually mean by consciousness? What is consciousness? Because we use the word in, in many different ways in our culture. It's a bit like, you know, the Eskimos have 20 words for snow because they have all these different meanings for snow. We just talk about snow or sleet or something. It's the same with consciousness. We just use the word consciousness. We mean many different things. You go to Sanskrit and you'll find about a dozen different words for consciousness, meaning a dozen different clearly delineated aspects of what we loosely call consciousness. So what do we mean when we say that somebody's conscious? Just look at some of the different meanings. I mean, the first obvious one is somebody who's awake is conscious. We say somebody who's asleep is not conscious. But we dream when we're asleep. We have experiences. Dreams happen in consciousness. So what we really mean when we say a person isn't conscious of sleep, we mean they're not conscious of the exterior world, usually, but they're still conscious of their interior world. So there's still consciousness. Or sometimes we talk about conscious, I wasn't conscious of what I was doing, meaning I wasn't paying attention. But there's still some consciousness there. An experience many of you, I'm sure, have had many times is driving down a familiar road, perhaps driving home at night, and you suddenly realize you weren't conscious of the last two miles. And yet clearly you were conscious, because if you weren't conscious at all, you'd been driving into trees and trucks and you wouldn't be there, you were conscious, but what we probably mean there is much of my attention was on what I'm going to do when I get home or what that awful thing that happened to me earlier in the day was or what I'm planning for my vacation. It's like your consciousness is taken up with other stuff, so just minimal consciousness is on the road, but enough to get you through. Another use today is 
spirituality. We talk about a conscious person. Oh, that's a really conscious person. You know, that person's really unconscious. You know, the leaders of our countries are really not very conscious people. <laughs> All countries, probably. <laughs> they're just as they're conscious. We, you know, talk about a more conscious person. What we really mean is, this more spiritual person is conscious of certain things, maybe certain levels of reality. The person we call quote unconscious is maybe just more conscious about. The, um, the, their bank accounts or whatever. But it's, a, it's just conscious in different ways. And then there's the one which scientists often come up with, is that human beings are conscious and other creatures aren't conscious. I'm sure you've heard that many times. You can read it all over the place. Human beings are the only conscious creature on this planet. <coughs> now, to me, you look at a, I mean, a dog. I love dogs. I, one of my favorite creatures, dogs and dolphins and actually most mammals, but dogs in particular. You know, a dog seems to dream when it's asleep. We see it twitching its legs, its nose quivering. We imagine it's chasing an imaginary cat or something <laughs> or whatever. Although if you think about it, when we chase something, you know, that we can hardly move our arms and legs in dreams. Perhaps the dog's having to say that it's trying to chase this cat, but it's like, oh. <laughs> the very fact we give dogs anesthetics when we operate on them, I find interesting. If we didn't believe they were conscious, why would we bother to make them unconscious? If you think about it. So, although we say dogs aren't conscious, we clearly believe they are if we give them an anesthetic. What we're really talking about here is self-awareness. When people say only humans are conscious, what they mean is only humans have an awareness of their own consciousness. They're self-aware. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but that's what they mean but clearly dogs are experiencing beings. What I mean by consciousness is a much more general thing. It's, it's like awareness, the very fact that we have experience. It's the capacity for experience, whether that's dreamlike, fantasy, whether it's intelligent, spiritual thoughts, whatever. It's the capacity for experience. And I distinguish these because you could say, on the one hand, there's the forms that arise in consciousness, all the different thoughts, perceptions, images that arise. And then there's the space. Buddhists often talk about consciousness as space. It's the space within which all experience arises. And a, an analogy that's often used for this is like the light in a projector, the light inside every projector, whether it's this projector here, film projector, slide projector, in the center of the projector is white light, undifferentiated light, light of all colors, which then shines through a slide onto a screen, and we get an image on the screen. And then we get caught up in the image. If it's a movie, we get caught up in the story. We start thinking it's real. We start sweating or laughing or whatever it is. We get totally immersed in what's happening on the screen and we forget it's all just light. Light that's been filtered by whatever's happening in the projector to take on a particular form. But the form is just sculpted light. That's all it basically is, is just sculpted light, which we see on the screen. And that light has the potential, that white light has the potential to become any image that you could think of, any movie you could possibly conceive of, made or unmade, that light could become anything. But we forget that. We just, unless we sometimes turn around and look at the projector and then you see where the light's coming from. But most of the time we watch the screen and get lost in the images. The same, I think, is happening in consciousness. We have this ability for experience. And then that takes form various perceptions, whatever it is, feelings, thoughts, are the forms which arise in consciousness. And probably the forms correspond to what determines the forms is what goes on in the brain. So the brain would correspond to the film in the projector. But that doesn't mean to say the film, the brain produces the consciousness. It may determine the shapes, the forms, the experiences that arise in consciousness. But to say the brain produces consciousness is a bit like saying the projector produces the light which shines through the film, or the, rather the film produces the light, whereas it's actually in the projector. And again, the same is true of consciousness in terms of its potential. You could say our consciousness has the potential to become 
every experience we ever have or could ever have or that any being could ever have, whether it's a human being or an extraterrestrial or a dog, whatever, every single experience that could ever be had is in, that, is in consciousness as a potential. And I'd just like to make one thing clear, distinction of what I mean by mind, because we use it in different ways, again, in our culture. Mind, in which I will be using it, I call it mind with a big M, capital M, are all the things like, it's everything that happens in consciousness, our perceptions, our memory, our sensations, imagination, <coughs> intuitions, feelings. These are all forms, appearances that arise in the mind. And then there's mind with a small m, which is things like our thinking, our reason, which we often talk about mind. We talk about mind as opposed to feeling, mind as opposed to heart. We're talking about mind with a small m. But for me, heart, feeling, emotion, that's all part of the big mind, that realm of overall experience. And the question that comes, and this is the, the big thorny question for science, is why is there mind? Why does all this neurological processing that goes on, why is there awareness with it? Why doesn't it all just go on in the dark? This is the, I could say, the $64,000 question. It's probably the $64 billion question. <laughs> and this is the paradox. Every, we all know we're conscious, and there's no way to explain it in science. It's easier to explain probably how the universe evolved from the Big Bang or whatever it was that set it off all the way through to the present day. That's easier to explain than why any of us ever has a single thought in our mind. Science prides itself on its predictive abilities. If you come up with a new theory in science, you always test it by seeing if it predicts the state of affairs correctly. But the one thing it doesn't predict is that any of us should ever have a single experience. This is what is currently called today the hard problem in science. Why, why are we conscious? Why do we have experience? Not so much how the brain affects consciousness. This has sometimes been called the easy problem of consciousness. David Chalmers, who was professor of philosophy in Arizona, he's actually just moved back to Australia, he said, the easy problems of consciousness are understanding what goes on in the brain when you have maybe a certain feeling or solve a certain mathematical problem, have a certain thought, we may one day understand that, which is like understanding what the film is like in the projector. We may one day understand what goes on in the brain when we have a certain experience. Those are the easy problems, relatively easy, very hard problems actually. We said the real hard problem is why any of that gives rise to experience. The way he put it was, how does something as immaterial as consciousness ever arise from something as unconscious as matter? We assume that matter is unconscious, and therefore our brain cells are unconscious, and all the chemical, electrical activity that goes on is unconscious. How the hell does consciousness come out of it? That's what's often called the hard problem of consciousness. I actually don't think it's a hard problem at all. I think it's an impossible problem. <laughs> it's actually we're asking the wrong question. And the reason is we're stuck in the wrong paradigm. And just very briefly, just to recap on paradigms, paradigm is a word that's often, it's got misused a lot in recent times. You know, we talk about paradigms in diets and goodness knows what. The original idea of paradigm was put forward by Thomas Kuhn. It's the basic idea that underlies any area of science. So quantum theory is a paradigm in physics. So is relativity theory a paradigm. You could say the DNA model is a paradigm in molecular biology. It's a sort of the deep, unquestioned assumptions that we think are true. We think are absolutely true and that science does all its work in. And what Kuhn showed was, we think they're true, but they change with time. And when, when they change, there's a big resistance. Scientists don't like changing their minds. 
you know, we'll change jobs, we'll change partners, we change where we live, but changing our minds, that's much, much harder. And so when this happens, when a new paradigm comes in, there's a huge struggle that goes on. And the classic case, which I just want to go over briefly because it's relevant to consciousness, is what happened 500 years ago with the Copernican Revolution. And before that, the old worldview was the Earth was the center of the universe and everything went round the Earth and in perfect circles because Plato said there's the Earth and there's the heavens. The heavens are perfect. Perfect motion is circular motion. Therefore, everything in the heavens has to move on a circle, which was true of all the stars, but the sun, moon, and the five visible planets didn't move in perfect circles. And so there was this question of why they were moving against the stars. And what the medieval astronomers did was come up with these ideas, sticking to circles. They had, well, maybe there were circles rolling around circles. And if you had a circle rolling around a circle carrying a planet, then sometimes it would go faster when it was at the top of the circle, and then it goes slow at the bottom, even go backwards. And they started playing with these things called epicycles. And that got a bit better, but it wasn't quite accurate enough, so they put more circles rolling around the circles, rolling around the circles, and they started shifting the axes around, and they started getting <coughs> things like this to try and explain it. And it got more and more cumbersome until along came Copernicus, who said two things. The first he said was the Earth spins, which everybody thought was absolutely stupid because it's absolutely obvious that the Earth is still, right? I mean, nothing's flying around this room. They argue, they said, quite logically at the time, if the Earth is spinning, all the oceans would slop up on one side. Bo a bowl of water would all slop up on one side. It doesn't, it's flat. Therefore, the Earth is not moving. Don't be stupid. <laughs> the second thing he said, which would have got him into a lot of trouble, except he didn't really say it until just before he died, <laughs> he, was, he was a churchman he was actually quite cautious about the Vatican he said the earth is a planet orbiting the sun and everybody thought that was not just stupid it was heretical and then we know the story along came Galileo about 60 years later and looked through his telescope and found evidence for it and the bishop said don't be silly we're not even going to look down your telescope <laughs> And then the other thing that happened exactly the same time was Kepler. He was looking at the actual orbits, and he realized the orbits weren't circles. It all made sense if the orbits were ellipses. He had no idea why they were ellipses rather than circles, but he broke the thing with Plato. Copernicus still stuck to Plato's idea of circles. And then it was actually later still, another 40 years after that, so Isaac Newton came along and actually showed that the laws of heaven and the laws of earth were the same, and when he did that, he realized that all orbits were ellipses and the whole thing made sense. But it took nearly 150 years for that revolution to happen. And so what Kuhn showed was there's a number of phases we go through. First, the existing paradigm encounters an anomaly. An anomaly is an inexplicable observation, something you can't deny but can't explain. And the planets were the anomaly there. In fact, the planet, the word planet means to wander in Greek. Planeta is wander. The wandering stars were the planets. Then what happens? Initially, the anomaly is ignored or sometimes rejected. It isn't really happening. <laughs> then, as it builds up, people try to explain it within the existing paradigm. That's the epicycles. Then, a new paradigm is proposed in which the anomaly is resolved, but that's usually rejected, often ridiculed. And then finally, it gets accepted as it begins to explain things better. This isn't a new idea, of course. Schopenhauer put it much better earlier. Every truth passes through three stages before it's recognized. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's opposed. Third, it's regarded as self-evident. <laughs> Max Planck, talking about the same thing, said, a new scientific idea truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually <laughs> die. <laughs> now, I think we are going through exactly the same thing with regard to 
consciousness and what is consciousness. Except what we are dealing with here is not just a paradigm, it's actually something much more fundamental. It's what I call a meta-paradigm. Meta meaning beyond. The meta-paradigm is the paradigm behind the paradigms. So behind all the different paradigms, whether it's quantum theory, relativity, DNA theory, any paradigm in science, behind that paradigm is a deeper underlying paradigm which runs throughout the whole of the scientific worldview. In fact, it basically runs throughout the whole of our social worldview. And that meta-paradigm, the current meta-paradigm, says the real world is the material world. This is the real stuff. Space, time, and matter are primary. And it, again, you know, just as it seemed obvious that the Earth was still, it seems obvious that this stuff is real. And we, we, don't, we don't question it most of the time. It, this seems the real world. But there's an anomaly in this worldview. And it's a real anomaly. I mean, things like remote viewing, reincarnation, healing, these are all problems for this worldview. But they're not yet real anomalies for the worldview because they're still not accepted as problems by the majority of scientists. Some people see them as problems. Other people just say, oh, we'll understand them later. It's just it's false reporting or coincidence, or whatever. So they're not yet the status of a true anomaly in the Kuhnian sense because they haven't yet got to the stage where everybody accepts it's real. There is, however, one anomaly for this worldview, this meta-paradigm, and that is consciousness itself. And it's a real anomaly because it cannot be doubted. We can't doubt the fact we're conscious. And it cannot be explained. And so what do we do? We do exactly what Thomas Kuhn predicted. We ignore it. <laughs> when we can't ignore it any longer, we try to explain it in terms of the existing model. It's what I sometimes call epicycling. It's a new word. Epicycling is to do with, is trying to fit things into the existing model. And so we think, well, maybe it's something to do with the complexity of the information processing that produces consciousness. Or maybe it's something to do with quantum effects traveling down these microtubules in the nerve cells that produces consciousness. There's lots of different theories about what produces consciousness in the brain. This is the epi we're in the epicycling stage, trying to fit consciousness into the old worldview, the old paradigm. No one ever questions the fundamental assumption. The fundamental assumption that is not questioned in the current meta-paradigm is that matter is insentient. We assume that matter is totally unconscious and that's where the problem arises. How does consciousness come out of something that is totally, absolutely unconscious? So the alternative meta-paradigm that I've been exploring is much more, another way of putting it, is consciousness is a fundamental quality of the cosmos as fundamental as space, time, and matter. Actually, that's not true. As we'll see in a moment, but I'm talking to more conservative audiences, I'd like to start them off with the fact that consciousness is, is as fundamental as space, time, and matter. Where we're going, where we're going is to see that it's more fundamental. But this is a halfway stage to take the mind along safely for the moment. <laughs> before we get down to the, the real stuff. Okay, there's a, there's a couple of ways in which consciousness is more fundamental, is primary. The first is something I've touched upon already, that consciousness is in everything. We see it in not just human beings. We assume that dogs are experiencing beings. She has this wonderful tuft on her head, and I just couldn't resist this day putting a, a bow on a tuft. By the same token, we think fish probably experience. They experience their watery world. They probably experience pain. You know, we sort of, if, if we catch a fish, we wouldn't feel too good about skinning it alive. You know, we, we feel it feels pain. There's some consciousness there. Going further down, what about jellyfish? 
Now, science would say, no, they can't be conscious, they don't have a nervous system. But that's just an assumption. Maybe what the nervous system does is bring the consciousness more into focus. But again, one of my intuitive tests for people is, which do you find it easy to do? To yank the plug out of your computer or pick up a jellyfish and throw it on the fire? There's something, you know, we feel there's something there. We don't feel good about throwing a jellyfish on the fire, even though it's got no brain. I believe consciousness goes all the way down, down to simple cells and even down to the fundamental units of matter, which we'll look at more in a minute what they are. Now, this isn't consciousness as we think of it. David Yesley talked about Bohm's idea of proto-mind. Other people talk about it as proto-consciousness. It's, it's something, it's the faintest, faintest glimmer of something. It, but it doesn't mean to say that you know, bacteria think or have feelings or whatever. Maybe a bacterium has this vaguest sense of whether it's warm or with the vaguest sense of some chemical acidity or something. It would just be a very faint glimmer. In fact, I've got here a picture of a bacterium's consciousness. That's what it looks like compared to ours. <laughs> but if you look carefully, it's not completely black. You see, there's a border around the bottom of the screen. There's something there. It's not completely, not completely nothing. There's something, something very, very faint. So consciousness is there all the way through. So that I believe what's happened as life has evolved, it isn't that life reached a certain stage, a nervous system or whatever it was, and then something magic happened. At that stage, something, it really is magic in modern science, something magic happened, and out of inert matter, suddenly mind appeared out of nowhere. I think consciousness, in essence, subjectivity, like the interior world is always there. And what has happened as the complexity of the physical world has evolved, so the images, the forms that appear in consciousness have also grown richer and more and more complex. Until today, you know, we have this very rich experience of the world. We have thoughts, we have feelings. And with human beings, also, we are aware that we are conscious, we are self-aware. We have this sense of I-ness. As Fred said, it's not really true, and I'll touch on that more later. But we have all this going on in our minds. So it's the contents of consciousness which have evolved, not consciousness itself. Consciousness has always been there. So this is the first way consciousness is primary. Consciousness is in everything. And the second bit is the opposite is also true. Everything is in consciousness. By which I mean whatever we experience, whatever we know, is actually an appearance in the mind. When we look at the world, we know, and this is something science cannot deny, it looks at this a lot. The neurosciences explore this in great depth. In fact, it was really the beginning of psychology 150 years ago, experimental psychology, was looking at how the image in the mind relates to the world out there. We assume that's what happens. We know it's what happens. When you're you know, looking at this world now, looking at the screen, looking at the room, we know what is going on is that light comes in through the eyes, hits the back of the retina, triggers electrochemical impulses which travel down nerve fibers to the back of the brain, where the brain very cleverly, in about a tenth of a second, puts it all together and says, this is what it looks like out there. The brain creates its own image of what is going on out there and very cleverly ties that in with the sound it hears, the feeling of sitting in the seat, whatever else, and creates this wonderful three-dimensional, hi-fi, surround sound, touchy-feely, virtual reality which we live in. But we're about a tenth of a second behind reality the whole time. We're never quite in the now. Try as we may. Well, we are in the now in a different sense. But. So, Again, this is something science cannot deny, but it never explores the implications of this. Everything we know is an experience in the mind. That's all we ever know. It's the forms which consciousness takes on. 
So you could say experience is an informing, an informing of consciousness. I like to think another meaning of information is the process that happens in the mind. Information is the formation of form, is the creation of form in the mind, the process of form arising in the mind. And this again, I think, is something which many of the mystics, teachers have seen. I remember the Maharishi used to say something I didn't understand at the time was knowledge is structured in consciousness. I mean, that everything we know is actually structured in consciousness. The stuff of our experience is, some people call it mind stuff. It's one of the words for consciousness in Sanskrit, chitta. Chitta is the stuff, the mind stuff, which gives rise to all these different experiences. And this was something that was realized 200 years ago by Immanuel Kant, who said there were two parts is the noumenon, what he called the noumenon, which literally means that which is perceived, we could call it the outside world, the thing in itself, and then there's the phenomenon, which literally means that which appears, and that's the representation in the mind, the forms in the mind. And what he realized was that we never know the thing in itself. All we ever know are the forms which appear in the mind. This was the basis of his philosophy, and it started off a whole string of philosophy in Europe at the time and debate and stuff. But the two are different. I think Eastern philosophy gets at the same sort of thing when it talks about Maya. Maya is often translated as illusion. A better translation, I think, is delusion. We delude ourselves when we think the appearance in the mind is the thing in itself. This is the delusion. And what science tries to do is to work out what the thing in itself is like. So a lot of physics is trying to work out what is the noumenon, what is the thing in itself really like. And it turns out it's nothing like we think, nothing like we experience. A good example is now, you know, you're seeing blue on the screen, bluey green. There's no blue there in reality. There's light reflected from the screen. That light has a certain frequency or a certain wavelength which triggers certain receptors, but they aren't blue receptors. The electrons that go to the back of the brain aren't blue electrons. The blueness is purely a quality that arises in the mind, in experience. The same with sound, music, As air vibrations, the music is an appearance in the mind. So what we start realizing is the world out there is actually nothing like our experience of it. And the fundamental mistake I think that we make the whole time is we mistake, literally mistake, our experience to be a representation, an accurate representation of the world, rather than realizing It's just our experience. The world itself is nothing like our experience. And this is what physics is beginning to realize. So we think we're seeing the world out there accurately. We've no idea what's actually there. There's something there which we perceive, which gives rise to color and shape. But what it actually is, we don't really know. Whitehead saw this. He said, the mind experiences qualities which are purely offspring of the mind alone. And the mistake is we take those qualities and think they exist out there. Now, when we look at matter, we used to think that matter was a nice little solid particle. The Greeks thought an atom was this lump of matter because that's what we have in the mind, that matter is solid. And then we realized that it was composed of lots of different particles clumped together, electrons, protons, neutrons, And then we began to realize that most of it was empty space. About 100 years ago, we realized it was more something like this. And in fact, if you made the nucleus of an atom the size of a golf ball, if you blew the nucleus up to the size of a golf ball, electrons would be like peas flying around about 300 feet away. So it's like a baseball stadium with a golf ball in the middle and atoms flying around the stands. That's how much matter there is in an atom. 99.999999% empty space. 
And that's not even true. <laughs> we now realize that even the electrons and protons don't actually exist. They're not particles. We call them particles. They're not actually particles. They're um, eigenvalues in a wave equation. <laughs> which means absolutely nothing to you non-mathematicians and means very, very little to mathematicians. <laughs> it really means it's the chances of observing something. There's doesn't seem to be much there. As Hans Peter Dürer said, whatever matter is, it's not made of matter. <laughs> this is a physicist talking, remember. Matter as we know it exists only in the mind. So what can we say about the nature of the noumenon, about the nature of reality? It's not matter. What can we say about it? Well, if we come back to this, if I'm looking at any of you, I don't know the truth of your body. It looks solid, it looks coloured. I know that in the physical world, it isn't. There's something, there's something there, I don't know what it is. There's electromagnetic fields, whatever they are, other, other fields creating this form, which functions very nicely. The only thing I'm prepared to say with certainty is that I believe you are a thinking human being. I believe you are experiencing so I believe you have your own world in there. But there again, I have no idea what that is like even. I don't even know what goes on inside your mind. I assume there's a mind there. <laughs> I assume you're not zombies who just laugh at the right things. <laughs> the only thing I can say for certain about you is there is consciousness just as that's the only certain thing you can say about yourself. The only certainty is there is consciousness. Now, if consciousness goes all the way down, this is not just true of dogs and cats and fish and everything else, it goes right down to the fundamental level. There's consciousness at this level. Whatever is happening at the quantum level, we could say there's some sort of interiority proto-mind, whatever you want to call it, proto-consciousness, some vaguest glimmer of an interior world there. And yet there seems to be nothing there. This is another assumption point in science. We assume that there is an objective reality. But all the indications are there may not be. So what if there weren't anything there. <laughs> so this is the second unquestioned assumption of the current meta-paradigm, that there is an objective reality. The alternative view is there is only consciousness. But it is structured consciousness. It is a mind field which has perturbations, fluctuations, variations, which we experience and translate in the mind into shape and color and form and matter and all this stuff. But it's actually consciousness observing the consciousness field and then creating all these appearances in the mind itself. The alternative meta-paradigm is there is nothing but consciousness. The consciousness is more fundamental than space, time, and matter. Space, time, and matter exists, but at a more, more gross level of manifestation, which we'll look at it briefly. What I see is there is consciousness, but because it's differentiated, it starts appearing in like little knots of consciousness. This, I suspect, is what People talk about the vacuum state in physics, the zero-point field that underlies the whole of material creation, which gives rise to particles bubbling out of it. Or someone mentioned string theory yesterday. We don't know what the strings are made of. We talk a lot about the strings as being dimensions, knotted dimensions in space, supposing the strings are actually strings of consciousness. Then what we have is consciousness 
observing itself. So there is only consciousness. Variations in the consciousness field are perceived as an image in the mind. So the material world that we know of is the appearance in the mind. In the actual world out there, there is nothing there. No thing there. It's not nothing, but there's no thing. Thingness is something which the mind creates. The mind turns experience into things. But maybe there isn't a thinginess to the world. There is no thinginess there. Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation said, matter derives from mind, not mind from matter. Now starts beginning to make more sense. So... We know there is not matter. It also turns out there isn't space or time either. This was Einstein's realization with the special theory of relativity, which he realized the speed of light is absolute, the same for all observers, whatever their speed, which was a complete weird thing at the time. If you're traveling down the road in a car at 40 miles an hour and somebody passes you at 60 miles an hour, they go past you 20 miles an hour faster, right? If light goes past you, light travels 186,000 miles an hour, you don't subtract the 40. It goes to 186 miles a second, it's much faster than that. You don't subtract the 40. Even if you're traveling at nine-tenths the speed of light, it still goes past you at the speed of light, not one-tenth. All observers measure the speed of light to be the same. The revolutionary thing that came out of that was that space and time are not constant but vary with the speed of the observer. Space and time are not fixed. So, you know, if a stationary observer observes a ray of light going by and it goes 186,000 miles in one second, somebody moving at 87% the speed of light, that's just the way the mathematics work out, would see half that amount of distance and half that amount of time. But the speed would still be the same. 93,000 miles in half a second is 186,000 miles a second. Someone moving at 99.5% the speed of light sees a tenth of that. 18,000 miles in a tenth of a second. Still the same speed. And what Einstein realized was there was something called the space-time continuum out of which space and time both appear. The space-time continuum, he makes it, it's not like space, it's not like time, it's not a mixture of the two. It's something we don't know. It's like Kant described, it's the noumenon. We can never actually know it. What we know is the space and time it gives rise to. But it never gives rise to the same amounts of space and time. Different observers see different amounts of space and time. So space and time vary. What he showed was there's something in space-time called the interval, which is like the equivalent of distance or seconds, the interval is actually the subtraction of the square of space and time. It's actually the square root of that. And that turns out to always be constant. So in space-time, there is a constant. The distance in space-time never changes, although what we experience as space and time changes. So this led to some more weird things about light. What happens if you actually do travel at 100% the speed of light? If you look at the way things are going, you're right. Light experiences itself traveling no distance in no time. From light's point of view, light does not exist in space and time. As Fred was saying at the opening, the birth and death of a photon are the same moment. Light doesn't experience itself traveling through space and time. There is no non-locality for light. It is one phenomena in one moment. This is light's point of view. So the reason for this is that the, the space-time interval in the space-time continuum for light is always zero. Always zero. So from light's point of view... No space, no time, no mass. Light does not exist in the world of space, time, and matter. So what do we make of this thing called the constant speed? 
I put speed in quotes deliberately. What we observe as speed, I don't think is speed at all. When I observe a light beam traveling from you know, the back of the room to my eye, in space-time, the beginning and end of that light beam are the same. Space-time is bent that they are the same. In my frame of reference, I stretch out that zero interval <laughs> into space and time. And I always stretch out 186,000 miles of space for every second of time. And if I'm moving very fast, I stretch out that much. Moving slower that much. Really slow, I stretch out that much. So I don't think C is a speed at all. It's the constant ratio of manifestation of space and time. For every 186,000 miles of space that appears, one second of time appears. And again, Kant was onto this 200 years ago. He said space and time are the framework within which the mind is constrained to construct its experience of reality. He didn't see that space and time were part of the external world. They're part of the mind. And it was 100 years later that Einstein came along and showed that he was true. And I think if we ever give a name to this revolution in consciousness, just as we talk about the revolution in the view of the earth as the Copernican revolution because Copernican started it I think this revolution in consciousness we should really call the Kantian revolution and it's only 200 years, Copernican revolution took 150 years, we're only 200 years into this revolution and it's much much more fundamental so space and time don't exist matter doesn't exist energy we often think is fundamental we all talk about energy as in the universe is energy, turns out it isn't And this comes to the other great breakthrough of the 20th century, same year as Einstein's theory of relativity, and Einstein was involved in this, quantum theory, and again to do with light. Fascinating enough, it's problems with light that started off quantum theory. And what Max Planck showed was that light comes in discrete packets of energy. These are called photons. Before that, it was thought that light was smooth, <coughs> continuous, and he showed it comes in packets, amounts, the word quanta actually means amount. And it's actually a quantum, not of energy, it's actually a quantum of action, which is often missed. Planck's constant is called the quantum of action. Now, what is action? Action's a word which we don't meet in school, but we should do. We come across things like mass, distance, time, velocity is mass time, you know, length divided by time, Underneath are just the units. This, this is how mathematicians look at it. So velocity is length divided by time. Momentum is mass times velocity. So you get it's mass times length over time. And those of you who did a little bit of maths or mechanics at school will remember that all this stuff. Action is just another one of these qualities. It's actually mass times length squared over time, which you can get it two ways. It's either, if you look at it, it's momentum times distance traveled, or it's energy times the time the energy is operating. That's action. But we don't normally meet it at school, except in some very fundamental principles. You've probably heard the principle of least action. It's actually a very important principle. It says in any, in any process, nature always does it in a way that the amount of action used is a minimum. The golden principle in physics. Everything goes by this principle of how do you keep action to an absolute minimum. So action turns out to be more fundamental. And Planck's constant, the quantum of action, it's called Planck's constant, and here it is. <coughs> For those of you who love zeros, very, very small, but it's not energy. Energy is erg. This is erg seconds. It's not actually energy. So Every single photon of light is an identical unit of action. So whatever the underlying field is, the unified field, the field of consciousness, whatever it is, it seems the, very, the first manifestation is actually action. So manifestation is action, is activity, which then begins to appear as mass and energy related again by we talk about the speed of light, E equals mc squared, and we think, what is the speed of light doing relating energy and mass? 
if you take C to be the ratio of, trans uh, ratio of manifestation of space and time, then it makes much more sense that energy and mass are related by the ratio of manifestation of space and time. <coughs> so, we're nearly there. By the way, there's another connection here between light and consciousness. Light has no space, doesn't know time, doesn't know mass. Consciousness isn't in the material world. It, doesn't, it isn't something with mass. More matter appears in the mind. But also, if you look at the mystical experience, the experience of pure consciousness, when all those forms in the mind that stir the mind up, the Yoga Sutras, the first line of the Yoga Sutras, say yoga, that mystical state, is the stilling of mind stuff, the stilling of all that whirling of chitta, of all those forms. When that stills down, you arrive at a state of consciousness in which time drops out. It is boundless. There's no sense of spatial boundaries. There's no matter. So pure consciousness that the mystics experience is just like light. So, where we seem to be going with this, the normal view of what happens with light is something like that. A photon goes from the point of emission to the point of absorption. From light's point of view, space and time are so warped that the point of emission, the point of absorption are coincident. And the photon is an exchange of action between two points is an interaction between two points which are, from its point of view, coincidence. There isn't a transmission across space and time. Space and time collapse. There is the exchange of an action. From light's point of view, from our point of view, it's different. From our point of view, it seems to cross space and time. And so we say, well, if light got from here to there, how did it get there? It must have traveled somehow. Did it travel as a wave? Or did it travel as a particle? And sometimes we look at it, it travels as a wave. Sometimes we look at it, it travels as a particle. That's because we have stretched out the zero interval into space and time and then try to answer the question from that frame of reference. <laughs> if you look at it from light's frame of reference, and I think the only real way to look at light is from light's own point of view, <laughs> not from our material point of view, it doesn't need to be a wave or a particle because it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so where, we, where we're getting to is sensory forms are in the mind. Color, shape, sound, matter is a construct in the mind. Space and time are part of the framework within which the mind interprets its experience. Wave and particle are just models of the mind. It comes back to what Whitehead said. These are just qualities in the mind which we mistakenly assume apply to the external world. They don't. Out there, we just have perturbations in the absolute, which we, which consciousness congeals into this material world we see and then believe in. The same is true, I think, also of causality. Causality is a construct in the mind, something else that Kant was playing with. And again, Jung looked into this. That we think in a causal way, but that doesn't mean the external world has to behave in a causal way. And we think in terms of locality. And what we're now discovering is what physics is finding out is the actual world out there is a non-local world. It's very, very, very weird, as Fred was pointing out, very, very weird. It's only weird when we insist on thinking that the way we experience it is the way it is. <laughs> and in between the two, we have light. Light isn't part of the physical world, it seems. It isn't part of the world of space-time matter. It seems to be the first manifestation of the absolute, whether in, physical, in the external world or within our minds, is light. Again, in the mystical experience, those deep levels of consciousness, light comes up a lot. People talk about light, the light of consciousness, the inner light, the divine light, seeing the light. 
So this turns the whole hard question inside out, as well as your minds. <laughs> the hard question is not how does insentient matter ever give rise to experience? How does consciousness manifest into all these diverse forms? Consciousness is fundamental. This, you answer this question, however, not through theory or mathematics or science. You do it by experiment, but the experiment is in the mind. And this is what the mystics have done. And the conclusions of these experiments come out statements like this. Here's Muktananda. Earth, moon, stars, and sun revolve inside me. Which, you know, to your average materialistic scientist is obviously a load of complete, absolute... I was going to say an English word, but I won't. Rubbish. <laughs> this is obviously the result of a mind deranged by too much meditation. But this isn't just unique to Muktananda. You find this again and again and again in mystical teachings. The world is inside me. We have this experience of the world in our mind, and then we think we are in the middle of it. It's not. It's all within us. So what the mystic is doing is experiencing this happening. They are quietening the mind down, letting go of their attachment to the story, and so instead of watching the movie and thinking it's real, they're seeing, oh, that's interesting, that play of light. It's all just the light of the projector moving around on the screen. It's all just happening in the light. Which brings us back to the age-old question which Fred touched upon. What do we mean by I? <coughs> Who am I? What is the self? Because we use the word so much, we think we know what it means. The number of times we use it each day, you think we knew what it meant. Turns out we don't. I mean, you ask anybody to define the I, and it's like, well, I'm Peter Russell, that's just my name. Well, I'm British, that just happens to be my passport, my where I was born. You know, I'm male. I could be living in a female body. I might have different feelings, reactions, emotions, worldview, but that sense of I-ness would still be the same. We even say, I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. <laughs> which is actually a very interesting statement when you think about it. I am not the same person I was 20 years ago. <laughs> who, you know, who isn't... You know, implicit in that is, I have always been the same, but my character, personality, worldview, choices, likes, dislikes may have changed. The things I surround myself with, identify with, have changed. But that sense of I-ness is the same sense of I-ness we had when we were five years old. What is this deep, deep sense of I-ness? This is what the mystics have explored, and even physicist Schrodinger looked into this, and he said, what is this I? He says, you will on close introspection, now note introspection, not analysis, close introspection, looking into yourself, i.e. meditation, find that what you really mean by I is the ground stuff upon which all experiences and memories are collected. So what we really mean by I, and this is what you realize, I think, the more meditation you do, is the feeling of I or amness is the feeling of consciousness itself. It's just that, that feeling of being something isn't actually anything to do with being an individual, just the feeling of being aware. And then we then make the mistake of thinking the I is a thing. It's this reification again. We make experiences things, we have this feeling of I-ness, and we say, oh, it's a thing. What is it? But there's nothing there. Just like there's no matter there. So the truth is you are consciousness, period. Nothing else. <laughs> and then this is the doorway to the divine. Thomas Merton said, if I penetrate to the depths of my own existence, to the indefinable am that is my self in its deepest roots, then through this deep center I pass into the infinite I am, which is the very name of the Almighty. Ramana Maharshi put it a lot more concisely, I am is the name of God. God is none other than the self. And again, you find it time and time again in all cultures, all times, that this is where we connect with the divine. 
the Upanishads say Atman is Brahman. Atman is the Sanskrit word for that sense of I ness, not the individual ego or the individual sense of self, nothing to do with the unique being, but it's that sense of I ness, which is probably the same for each and every one of us. That sense of I ness which I feel, that sense of being me, something, is exactly, I think, what each of you feel. Yeah. The Memories I have, my experiences, my wishes, all that stuff is very different. But that sense of i which is there is exactly the same for each of us. And that's the Atman, that sense of i is Brahman, the source of everything. Brahman is the universal source. Translate that into English and you get things like, <laughs> I am God. Very, very dangerous statement to make. because people misunderstand every single word in that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Ram, Ram Das tells his story of how he went to visit his brother in a mental institution, and his brother says to him, how come I go around the world saying I am God and they lock me up and give me all these medicines and things to try and convert me? You go around the world saying you are God and everybody flocks to your talks and lectures. <laughs> And he said, ah, says Ram Dass, the difference is, I also say that everybody else is too. Yes. <laughs> when mystics make this claim, we misunderstand them to be saying, well, the ordinary world misunderstands them to be saying, you know, me, Peter Russell, is the guy who created the universe. Doesn't mean that at all. Right. It's that experience of that deep, deep sense of i that deep sense of am yes. is what we call God. And when you're in deep meditation, the qualities that start arising are the qualities we ascribe to God. You know, God is peace. There's that deep peace in meditation. It's that the heart opens, that feeling that one is love. You know you are love. It's usually covered up by all the other stuff that's going on. God is light, the light of consciousness. In fact, if we say God is, even looking from a traditional point of view, God is the source of everything, Everything in the world, as I've been saying, is a manifestation of consciousness. God is consciousness. The way we know God is by knowing consciousness in its essence. And of course, just to finish, show this isn't new, one of my favorite quotes from 12th century Spanish mystic Ibn al-Arabi. God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plant, stirs in the animal. <laughs> and awakens in man. I would like to modify that and say begins to awaken in man. <laughs> I think, and woman. <laughs> the process we are engaged in at this time in the evolution of our culture is the full awakening of our consciousness, the full awakening to what it means to be conscious, the full awakening to our own inner divinity, and not, again, through an intellectual awakening we can read all that stuff in books all over the place and go to talks on it. Yeah. It's actually doing that work and awakening to that truth yeah. in oneself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.